Hello again. This is Barry Chase, the senior partner at Chase Lawyers, coming to you today from my office in beautiful downtown Miami, where it's a nice sunny day. And today we're going to talk about something sunny as well. We're going to talk about record labels. You know, there's always been music back in uh, the old days in the 18th century, the 19th century, but record labels couldn't get started until there was a way of recording music. Before that time, you had uh, people composing music for live shows, for stage shows, like the one that Abraham Lincoln was watching when he was assassinated. So there's always been the music, but to record music, there was no real good way to do that until around 1900. And at that time, the way to record music conventionally was to put it on one of those piano rolls that you may have seen in the old days, where there is stiff paper that sort of gets rolled around a, a piano mechanism and there are holes punched in it, which created the music because they instructed the piano what hammer to hit what string was now up. So that's the way music was first recorded on those sort of awkward music roles. And the reason why the right to record a composer's music uh, on a piano roll was called a mechanical right. And that's because the machine that punched the holes in the roll was a mechanical machine. Now today, as you know, there's nothing mechanical, there's even nothing physical very much about music. We get it all digitized. But what happened was that it's gone through these phases from piano rolls to discs of various kinds, you know, vinyl, and then CD-ROM type discs. And then today we have really, it's fully digitized where there is no physical object whatsoever. So that's what the evolution has been. Now, one other note before we go to anything else. Record labels own the copyright in particular sound recordings. Publishing companies, which are not record labels, music publishing companies, owned the rights of composers and the composers get paid when record labels put the composer's work on a sound recording. So that's what record labels do. They own the copyright in sound recordings. So what's your first step in setting up a record label? Should you just go out there and say, well, it's John Smith Records? Or should you set up what's called a limited liability entity, which basically is either a limited liability company or a corporation of some type? Now, at Chase Lawyers, we very much prefer the LLC route, the limited liability company route, for a couple of reasons. First of all, uh, they have less um, complication than corporations. Corporations have been around for three, 400 years. So in that time, courts and legislatures have had a chance, frankly, to muck them up a lot. There are a lot of rules, a lot of things designed to assure no uh, violation of, of relationships in corporations. LLCs, on the other hand, are only 30 or 40 years old, at least in the United States. And so there are fewer requirements. You don't have to have share certificates, you don't have to have a meeting every year of the shareholders, which is a silly thing to have to have to have to do if it's your company and you're the only shareholder. You sit down with yourself, says the lawyer, and decide to elect yourself as the director of the company and the CEO. And that's all got to be written up at least once a year, or it may be that your corporation will be punctured if it's ever sued. One or another of those vehicles is terribly important, and for two reasons. One, you want to limit the liability to the company's assets because it, 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 when you set up an LLC or a corporation, it's considered a separate entity from you. So there's John Smith and there's John Smith LLC, although I would recommend you use a different name, but the LLC is completely separate from John Smith. So that if there's a problem down the road, and by the way, when you start making a lot of money, you'll get sued people will try to get a piece of it from you, whether they deserve it or not. Um, so you wanna be careful that the, they can sue only against the company assets 
and not the brand new Maserati that you bought yourself as a, as a present because one of your artists uh, just had a big hit. Um, so that's the first reason. You wanna limit that liability. It's the same reason why people set up corporations hundreds of years ago. Number two, if you come out with just John Smith records, you just don't seem as professional or as serious as if it's John Smith LLC. Much better, of course, if it's Smith Records or if it's uh, Records LLC or something like that, which isn't just your name. But you wanna have a, a company that's gonna hold all the intellectual property rights, which is basically the rights in the masters. You may recall that I said that it's the copyright in sound recordings that record companies own. And it should be a company and it should be a company where all of those copyrights are owned by the company in its own name, where all the documents are signed in the company name, where everything that gets done, the letterhead, et cetera, it should all be done by your company. The short answer is yes, very much yes. Uh, at Chase Lawyers, we recommend that you open a bank account in your new company's name right away because you have to establish this division between John Smith as a person, which you are, and John Smith Records LLC, which is not a person. It's a legal construct, which is treated as if it's a separate person from John Smith. So it's important that you open a separate bank account. Now to do that, you're gonna to have to go into your friendly neighborhood bank and we'd recommend you deal with the same bank that you've been dealing with as John Smith, the person, uh, and go in and show them what's called a federal employer's identification number, which doesn't mean that you actually have to have any employees, but you do have to have this number because it's the tax number that you'll use. And the bank will insist that if you're going to set up a separate account for a separate entity, it have its own separate tax number. Uh, they're, they're obligated to have that. So you'll do that. It's one of the things we do really with no charge at Chase Lawyers once we set up your LLC for you. So go ahead, go into your bank, go into the same bank you're used to dealing with, set up this separate LLC, and you're ready to go as an LLC. Now, for all of you who thought that uh, co-mingling was a sexual reference, I hate to disappoint you, but what we're gonna be talking about is, again, the separation between the company's assets and your own personal assets. One of the things that will happen if and when you ever get sued and get into court, um, which as I say, if you're successful and start making a lot of money, you're at least gonna be threatened with lawsuits. Whether or not they have any merit is another question. but. Let's assume you're in court and the judge sees that you've been using company assets to buy your own personal Maserati. Uh, you've been using company assets to pay for your wife's cosmetic surgery or what have you. Uh, that's a no-no because that means you haven't really been treating your LLC as a separate company. And if you haven't been, well, why should the judge restrict someone who wants to sue you from going after your personal assets, since you've treated the company as if it is your personal asset. So be very careful not to commingle your assets personally and your expenses personally with the expenses that are really and truly, at least reasonably, the expense of the LLC. Now, if you have a, a friend or a business associate that might want to become a partner with you in the LLC, and by the way, the word isn't really partner, the legal word is a member. You're a member of the LLC. You may want to come in, particularly if you can get some money from this investor. The answer is yes, take the money and set it up so that you're both members, quote unquote, of the LLC, which means you're both owners. Now, if you do this though, you must have in writing something that's called an operating agreement in some jurisdictions. It's called an LLC agreement in Delaware, for example, but it doesn't matter what it's called. It's basically an agreement that says, okay, this member does this, that member does that, this member collects X percent, that member collects Y percent, that member 
pays X percent of the expenses, et cetera. It lays out the relationship between you and your new business partner, and it will deal with things like, what happens if we split up down the road? What happens if despite our relative youth, one of us is run over by a truck? Do we have to start dealing with the legal heirs of the other member of the LLC who you may not know, you may not like, they might know, not know anything about the music business, and you really don't want to be in business with them. You want it to be in business with your now deceased business partner. The operating agreement between the two of you will take care of all that stuff. It'll take care of where does the trademark that the company owns in its own name, for example. Where does that go? How is that dealt with? But if you wait until the event actually happens, one of you is run over by a truck or God forbid dies from a disease, uh, you're gonna have a lot of trouble if you don't have something in writing about exactly how the company is gonna be managed. So do that if you have any second person aside from yourself as a member of the company. So how do you measure the commercial success of this LLC that you started, this record label that you're working on? Well, there are five factors that have been as old as the first record label that was ever established. Obviously, revenue and net revenue. Are you making money with this? Will be the most obvious first factor that will indicate to you you're doing pretty well. But to get there, there are four other factors that underlie it. And these are the four old factors that underlie it. We're gonna be talking about two new ones in this digital age. But among the factors that are gonna uh, tell you whether you're gonna have revenue success are, do your artists have talent? You still need talent in this business. Yes, there's a lot that can be done with PR and obviously looks matter, though that's part of talent in the, in the music business. Um, but you'll need to have some talent or your artists will need to have some talent. You'll all need some talent. The second is how big a room can your artists fill? When they do a live gig, is it in front of 100 people at a sort of intimate bar or is it in front of a football stadium with 50,000 people in attendance? Those are the two sort of poles. But uh, you, you'll know based on how big an audience your artists can attract, whether or not they've got the talent and whether or not your business is actually succeeding. Now, beyond that, the artists will need what they've always needed. They'll need charisma, which is a very elusive factor. Some people have it, some people don't. When they walk into a room or even a football stadium, there's an electricity that flows through the crowd and some people don't. They show up and there just isn't that kind of response. So you'll know that by the kind of response your audiences are giving to your talent. And then finally, and this is something that's as old as the hills and gets ignored too often. When you're signing your artists, and we'll go into some of that in a moment, but when you're signing your artists, you want to sign people who have shown that they're going to be dependable in a business sense. It doesn't do you any good to have the most charismatic, most talented, uh, most uh, uh, appealing artist in the history of the world if they won't show up to a recording session. If they're too zonked out on booze or drugs or what have you, so that they can't get through a recording session and do all the takes that will be necessary to get the, the master that you're looking to develop. So uh, keep in mind that that old fashioned factor of somebody you can depend on, that's still something you need to worry about. Okay, so what are these mysterious two new factors that you have to look to to measure your label success? Or to give you a shot, if you're the artist who's behind the LLC, to give you a shot at getting signed by a bigger label and having perhaps a global reach for the talent that you've already displayed. Now, there are two new factors going on that have displaced what used to be what was called the golden ear. The golden ear was someone at a label, an a and person, which means artists and repertoire. Um, the golden ear meant that you had someone on the label staff who could listen to someone, maybe meet them, have a live audition done, and right then and there say, that's someone who's got the charisma and all the rest that we need to make for a successful artist. Sometimes that worked 
gangbusters. Sometimes it was a huge failure and the record label invested in someone who in fact did not make the money. Now these days they don't have to guess that way because they'll have metrics for your social media and online presence. One of those metrics will be how many followers you've got on your social media accounts. If, if you or someone on your behalf, like someone at Chase Lawyers, comes to a label trying to get a new deal for you with a bigger label, and you don't have very much in the way of followers, we're gonna get nowhere. Even more so, if you don't show some ability to sell your music online, you've got to be able to sell it as either a DIY, do it yourself, uh, artist, or for a small label, you've got to show that you're able to sell for the label. If you haven't been able to hit it on those two metrics, you're going to have trouble. So you have to start by getting your social media these days and your online sales in line with someone that a big label or a small label will want to hire. Okay, well, let's get into the nitty gritty of what you're really interested in here, which is what kind of contract are we talking about? What kind of relationship are we talking about between this John Smith LLC that you've set up and the artists that you wanna sign who are actually gonna be the inventory that you've got along with the intellectual property that you and they create in their sound recordings. So let's start with what kind of copyright we're talking about. Now, uh, as you uh, sign an artist, what you wanna own from the artist is the rights to the sound recordings that you're gonna make with the artist. Now, there are two separate copyrights in music. This is where I have to get you a little bit into the legal weeds, and I don't wanna lose you, but let's try to describe these. There's the copyright that the composer has in what the composer creates. Now keep in mind, before the composer sits down in a room by him or herself, or perhaps there's a group of them, uh, nothing exists. There is no song, there is no music. The composer then creates lyrics and melody, or perhaps just melody, or perhaps just lyrics. There are great songwriting teams you may have heard about, like Rodgers and Hammerstein, um, and who, where one of them did most of the lyric work and the other did most of the melody work. Um, but those are basically the elements. And those are, the, those are all embodied in the composer copyright. Now, in the old days, before the Beatles, the really old days, um, the, the copyright in the composer's work was ne not necessarily at all held by the same person who performed the sound recording. People like Frank Sinatra, Bing Crosby, et cetera, didn't write their own music. Someone wrote music for them. They performed it. It may have become known as, you know, Sinatra's uh, My Way or what have you, but he didn't write it. Um, so the copyright in the composition, in the actual underlying song that Frank performed on, belonged to a composer. And usually you haven't even heard of that composer's name. Think about the, one of the largest selling singles in the history of the universe, I'm Dreaming of a White Christmas. If you're not familiar with it, I'm going to sing a little bit of it for you right now. I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. Right. So you'll all know and you'll all understand now why I'm a lawyer and not a talent. But the, the, the fact of the matter is that that's, that song has been recorded about a thousand different times. It's been recorded recently by Garth Brooks, by, um, uh, by um, Kelly uh, Clarkson, and by a lot of other contemporary artists. There have been about a thousand recordings of White Christmas going back to 1942 when a man named Irving Berlin, who wrote a lot of important songs like God Bless America as well, a man named Irving Berlin wrote White Christmas. He wrote both the lyrics and the melody. And so every time you hear White Christmas, uh, assuming that it's still in copyright, which it is in some senses, uh, Irving Berlin's composition gets paid. It isn't owned anymore by his own record, by his own publishing company, sorry, his own uh, publishing, music publishing company, but it's owned by someone. And every time any of those thousand renditions of White Christmas gets done, the record company has to pay Irving Berlin's copyright interest 
for what's called a mechanical license. You may remember we talked about how putting a composer's work on a sound recording um, leads to a mechanical license payment for each time that the music is sold, each time that a recording is sold. So that's the composer copyright. The sound recording copyright is each one of those thousand different sound recordings of White Christmas. So you have to keep those two things straight. The sound recordings, again, are gonna be owned by the record company, including your record company. And uh, that's going to be the, co the kind of copyright you're going to have. Now, um, in the 360 deal that has become the, the, the standard in the music industry, and let me explain what that means. 360 refers to the 360 degrees of a circle. It used to be that record companies would sign an artist only for sound recording copyrights. But now an artist tends to be signed because the record label is gonna make a huge investment in this new artist, usually seven figure investment. Um, uh, now we have the record companies wanting to take a piece of everything that leads to revenue engendered by this artist. So that even things like a clothing line that the artist may lend his or her name to, uh, the record company will want a piece of that. If the artist becomes a movie star, the record company will want to own a piece of that. The artist's live gigs, the record company will own a piece of that. And that's the 360 degree deal, which was really birthed because record companies in the early 2000s saw that their sales of records began to decline, mostly because of piracy. Um, and they, they thought to themselves, well, gosh, we've got to refill that hole that now exists because record sales have declined. Um, and the way they did it is by creating this 360 deal, which sure and surely enough rewards them for the fact that they're going to make this artist into a star. So it's a 360 degree deal that you're going to want to sign your artist to if you're a record label. And if you're a talent setting up your own label, then you're likely to have to sign a 360 deal with any record label that you want to sign with. Now, uh, you might be curious at this point as a non-lawyer, um, what's in a 360 deal that I keep on referring to? And we touched on some of the major points and the major purpose of it and the reason for its name. But uh, in part two of this uh, online presentation, we're gonna be talking about things like exclusivity clauses in the contract and the artist deliverables and who owns what um, and whether or not uh, you can transfer your rights in an artist, whether you can transfer your rights in yourself if you're the artist to a bigger label if the opportunity comes up. So stay tuned for part two. Now, if you can't wait for part two uh, and you wanna know what's in a 360 immediately, feel free to drop us a line, drop me an email at barry at chaselawyers.com. That's B as in boy, A-R-R-Y at chaselawyers.com. Uh, you can give us a call at the office, 305-373-7665. Or you can visit our website, which is, uh, sensibly enough, chaselawyers.com. So if you want to do that, we're happy to hear from you. Otherwise, stay tuned for part two. So if you like this video, hit the thumbs up button below and let us know. Also, you can subscribe to the Chase Lawyers YouTube channel for more legal tips for those in the entertainment industry like yourself. And if you have other topics you want us to cover, please let us know in your comments below so that we can help you out in that way too. See you soon.